Welcome to our webinar on Sales Coaching 101. Uh, we have a really large crowd registered for today. So as we are uh, waiting for folks to join, please indicate in the chat where you're from. Give us your name, where you're, where you're joining us from. We want to hear from you. We wanna make this as interactive as possible. Uh, hi, Lisa, Lisa from Michigan. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining. Oh, Zurich, we, we're going uh, international uh, there, Dan. Absolutely, absolutely, around yes. the world. Yeah, awesome, Brighton. Dominican make Republic. Stop in the way back. Yeah, excellent, excellent, okay. Well, just a couple of housekeeping items as well. We will be recording this webinar, so it will be sent out um, for anyone that has registered. And as we go through the content today, please continue to engage in the chat. Please uh, send us your questions through Q&A. We do have some time reserved at the end of the session today. Um, we will also be taking questions as we go. So we really want to make sure that we uh, hit on everything that we can. Uh, and right down the road from in Winston-Salem, welcome everyone. So again, we are talking about sales coaching, sales coaching 101. We're gonna talk about those strategies for highly effective coaching conversations. Um, this is a topic that we at the Brooks Group are passionate about. Our founder, Bill Brooks, began his career as a football coach. And so coaching, um, you know, as a mindset, as a methodology has been deeply embedded in our organization since our founding 45 years ago. So joining me today is Dan Markin, the ultimate sales coach. He is our VP of sales strategy and consulting. Um, he's a former sales leader himself, and he leads our facilitation coaching and consulting team. So if you've joined any of our webinars previously with Dan, you know we're going to have a lively conversation. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, Michelle. It's great to be with you again. Great to be here. Yes. And uh, we're going to go ahead and dive into this content. So again, um, add those comments and questions um, into the chat and the Q&A. So first thing we want to talk about really is why coaching is so important. Let's just level set for a minute. We did a, a research study, we recently published it, on the best practices of high-performing sales teams. And we found that 58% of successful teams, and those um, are teams that hit their quotas, their revenue goals in the previous year, use coaching for continuous training and development. Uh, that's compared to 44% of underperforming teams. And 68% of teams that are mostly or fully engaged receive coaching from sales managers. Uh, so coaching clearly makes a difference in performance, but I think there's definitely room to grow. Wouldn't you say, Dan? Yeah, absolutely, Michelle. And I agree with you 100%. I mean, coaching obviously is paramount. It's important. The thing that I would add to that, though, is what's even more important and better is good coaching. And, you know, often I'm reminded sometimes of all the things I'm not very good at. I had to replace a sink here at my house this weekend. And uh, I was reminded while I got it done and it took longer than needed to, I am not a plumber, clearly. And uh, I was reminded when I got to the gym the next day that while I was working out and doing those kind of things, I wasn't uh, an expert in physiology or, or a trainer. And so I bring that up because many of us, if you, if you kind of um, had a similar experience as I, been put into coaching rules kind of without a lot of coaching ourselves. And coaching is a perishable skill. It's something that can be developed. And so I share that with you because it's important that we refine and develop that craft to make sure not only that we're having coaching conversations, but good coaching conversations. We're going to talk a little bit uh, within the next hour about how you can make sure that you're doing that. So I agree 100% with Michelle. Yeah. And I appreciate that. Um, that qualification on good coaching conversations, because, you know, what's what's the point of having a coaching right. conversation if it's not even effective, right? Right, that's right. Yeah, so let's talk about types of coaching conversations. And these are the, these are the ones that I think we find are most common. Um, you know, we, we look at pipeline reviews, opportunity coaching, and then skills and performance coaching. And what I have found, and Dan, I'd love your thoughts on this, yeah. but um, most sales managers focus on the first two. They're all important, but the, the, the um, 
I think the emphasis tends to be placed on, on pipeline reviews, opportunity coaching or deal coaching, as it were, as opposed to the, the performance coaching. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you use a very important word there, Michelle. You said sales managers. And regardless of our title, I think we need to think about what is it we are endeavoring to do with our business. If we want to manage, then we're going to obviously kind of focus on those top two. And those are, for most in most cases, lagging indicators, things that are already there, things that have already happened. But if we really want to lead and be transformative uh, in this competitive environment that we um, are, are saddled with, we've got to start thinking about those leading indicators. And that's the indicators and behavior that our sales reps um, you know, have and possess. And more importantly, not only accurately diagnosing them, but leveraging them for more success. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Leveraging them for more success in the future. So again, how much time are you spending thinking about the things that have already happened, what we sold last month, what we sold last quarter? versus what we should be doing to affect the results next month, next quarter. This idea of leading versus lagging. One point that, uh, one last point I'll make on that is that while we always focus on lagging uh, indicators, it's already happened. It's already been completed. You can't change it. So it's really important to affect the future to be thinking about the goals, trends, perspectives that we need to uh, embrace and drive to uh, accomplish the results that we like. Yeah, great point. I I also tend to think of like performance coaching, skills coaching, as you say, kind of those leading at um, indicators, forward thinking as more of a strategic kind of play as opposed to a tactical play, as opposed to firefighting or you know like dealing within the now, which oftentimes deal coaching Absolutely. or opportunity coaching can be. So sometimes I think that skills coaching falls to the well. I know it's important but it's not the most urgent thing on my plate right now. I've got to, yeah. you know, get my, my team to, to close right. deals. Or, or we jump in and do it ourselves. I don't have right. time to coach them right now. Let me just kind of take over. And it's important right. to understand if you do that, you know, from a psychological perspective, you are kind of conditioning an individual to come to you to help solve their problems. And what you're going to hap have happen over time is that that's going to continue and you're only going to get busier. So again, this idea of focusing on behaviors, leading indicators, is really how you need to set the stage to be transformative as a leader. Right, right. Um, and James here just made a, a comment. Um, you know, if you think about knowing your audience, your homework is done through pipeline reviews. And I think that's a great point. Pipeline reviews, opportunity coaching, these are great ways to inform your skills and performance coaching. Yeah, great. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, let's now think about um, effective coaching strategies. So what does a good skills or performance coaching conversation look like? And that's what we're really gonna be focused on today is how do we do that forward thinking kind of developmental coaching? And before we get into it and it kind of expand on the, um, the points we have here on the slide, I think first and foremost, you need a sales process. It gives you a framework of skills to coach to, a way to evaluate performance, like James was saying, using those pipeline reviews to inform your coaching. Um, but I think, you know, we, Dan, I know I've said it, I've heard you say you've got to have a sales process to coach to. Right. I mean, think about other professions that are outside of the coaching or sales industry that use processes. I mean, I feel a lot better about the fact when I get on an airplane that the pilots are following a checklist and a process to make sure that they increase the probability of a safe and successful flight. And I think it's an important point that, you know, having a process does not guarantee or ensure success. There's nothing really in life that's certain, to, except for the morbid fact that sometimes at some point in time, we're going to cease to live it. But what's really more important to understand is that life is a game of probabilities. Your coaching conversations are a game of probability. And as we move through this, it's important to recognize the probability of getting the outcome that you want versus the probability of slipping away. Because either one of those two things is happening in every interaction, in every dialogue, be it coaching or selling. And so the process helps you make in-time, in-flight adjustments to make sure you're increasing the probability for your desired outcome. Great. I think that's a great, great point. All right. So when you're structuring that coaching conversation, first thing we say is ask, don't tell. So I think managers, coaches can have a tendency or may have a tendency to kind of jump into telling mode. Here's what you need to do. 
<laughs> versus asking questions, open-ended questions, kind of, you know, it's using a lot of the same sales principles that we teach about going three deep, asking those deeper, those deeper mm -hmm. questions, and then listening. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important to recognize sometimes because we are busy and we have competing demands, as Michelle said earlier, we put off the coaching conversations, especially sometimes with maybe our performers that have more opportunities than our more yielding or higher performers. And what happens when we do that, we start to move into this telling kind of uh, environment where we are frustrated, possibly, time is of the essence, and we didn't deal with things up front. And so we'll talk in a few minutes, but I would encourage you through a process, make sure you establish a cadence that is repeatable and that you adhere to for coaching conversations so you don't get caught behind the eight ball in terms of having to have these conversations. Because in those situations, the probability of the message that you intend to have that rep here is going to diminish. And so again, these are small things that can make all of the difference in terms of increasing the probability of a good interaction and good coaching situation. Yeah. Are there questions that you tend to fall back on or use regularly in a uh, in a coaching conversation? Yeah. So one of the, th the first things that, that uh, I ask is, you know, as we all do, tell me about that. How do you think that went? What's going well? And here's the other thing that I'll make a point of is that often what we do is because we've been conditioned from a young age to focus on the things that people don't do very well. Uh, we go through performance review processes often in our organizations and often we come out of those interactions with things we need to do better and things that we need to improve on. Um, people have an intrinsic desire to feel and to be valued. And the best way you can show value is to recognize what that individual does well. And I say that not because it will make them feel valued and it's a nice to do, but because when we have dominance in a skill set or attribute, we want to leverage that skill set and that attribute more often to be more effective. Again, think about a think about a sports team. They're going to go out when they're playing a really good team and try to do what they do better than anything else in hopes or to increase the probability that we're going to win. And so, again, I just share that with you because it's easy to go quickly to here's what you need to improve on. But people are successful because of what they do well, not what they don't. So, again, it's a healthy balance in terms of asking the right questions. What do you think went well? How could you improve on already what went well to make it better? Um, if you had it to do over again, what would you do differently? And so there's a myriad of questions. But to Michelle's point, I think it's important to adapt establish expectations, and strike the right balance. It needs to be conversational and coaching at the same time. Yeah, yeah, great point. And on the adapting um, kind of component there, understanding your own style, how you communicate, how you come across, as well as that of your um, of your sellers, right? And, um, you know, assessments, you've heard us, if you've been on any of our webinars before, you have certainly heard us talk about the value of assessments, the, the value of knowing yourself, as well as, you know, being able to adapt. But that is critical. If you are dealing with someone with a seller whose style is different, you want to adapt, and that's going to make it much easier to engage. Yeah, um, co yeah. co-creating a solution. So again, I think that kind of is related to asking and not telling. Um, again, not coming in with a demand, but involving the seller and kind of that that solution of how to develop. Yeah, you know, I think it's important to recognize our job as leaders is really kind of um, twofold. And the first thing we have to do is we have to open doors for our reps and our direct reports, um, and we have to remove obstacles. That said, we can open the door and remove the obstacles, but it's still incumbent upon them to walk through them. And often what I see is that uh, sales leaders, sales managers work hard to do those things, but sometimes they're going beyond that 50% threshold in terms of a healthy relationship. And so I think the co-creation of getting buy-in from the seller in terms of, hey, what can you assure me that you are going to do moving forward? And what do I need to assure you that I'm going to do? That 50% threshold, I mean, in psychology, we talk a lot about a healthy relationship is one where two parties meet at the 50% threshold. If you've ever been in one of those relationships, you know how hard it is just to get to the 50% threshold. So 
for every degree that we go past 50, we become increasingly more exhausted. So it's important that we safeguard guard ourselves, create, co-create the solution by opening doors, removing obstacles, so our sellers are able to do that and gaining agreement. Yeah, yeah. Aaron here in the chat has said um, an effective question that he's suggested is, tell me how you might solve this. And he says that you know, 95% of the time, the rep actually knows instinctively the answer. So involving them, as you're saying, involving them yes. in that that solution also generates buy-in. So right. um, yeah. And it's important to recognize that there are many different ways to get a good result. And often what I've seen um, you know, in the consulting world sometimes is that because something particularly worked for us, we automatically think or believe that that is the gold standard and the way it should be done. Right. And I think what's important about that is, is that people are different. You want to embrace the differences, be results focused. Um, but again, different ways uh, to solve things is part of the difference that we bring as human beings. And so uh, it's important to not, I think sometimes for lack of a term, over control the process, but have a collaborative conversation about the pros and cons of different solutions as um, you know, we had just talked about to uh, to get where we need to get to. Yeah, great point. And then establishing expectations, next steps. I mean, I think the one thing that I, I see with organizations and I hear from clients is that there's no follow through, there's no follow up. And we're going to talk a little bit about coaching follow up in a little bit, but just setting those, what those expectations are for performance and next steps. Absolutely. And uh, finding the right balance. So being able to balance conversations um, you know, between pipeline reviews, opportunity um, coaching, and that developmental or skills coaching. What are your thoughts and advice for, um, for managers in terms of how they can balance these types of conversations? Yeah, so I think, you know, in a previous life, I had um, some counterparts that I work with that were sales leaders. And a strategy that they would implore sometimes is to uh, call a sales rep maybe on a Tuesday evening and say, hey, listen, I'm flying in tomorrow morning. Pick me up at the airport, Nate. I want to ride the day with you. I want to go spend the day with you. Well, in that situation, it kind of seems like a, a gotcha moment. And so personally, I would advise against that because you're not setting the person up for success. It's it's while you want to see them in their natural environment, give them the opportunity to showcase their skills. And so finding the right balance between obviously letting people be prepared, understanding that we, we still want to engage them. We want to see their territories. We want to see their markets. But again, the balance in that conversation really comes from what you observe and what they see. Two people can see the same thing and have very different thoughts or feelings about it. So I think it's important, again, if we want to be transformative, to approach things with an open mind, set people up for success, and that's the best indicator of how well people will do. There's no replacing, and I hope or I think that many of you would agree with me, one thing you cannot instill in a sales rep or any individual for that matter is heart. When I say heart, I mean the desire to get it done, the desire to work hard. We're going to talk about those behaviors and results in a second. So it, to me, it's just as important if I give someone three, four days a week notice to see what they come up with, see how they prepare, because that's going to give me behavioral indicators about what they're doing when they're given the opportunity rather than kind of a gotcha moment. Because if I know they can do it and then they're not doing it, that's going to lead me to a different conversation along the way as well. Yeah, right. Great point. All right, let's talk about barriers to coaching. So we've talked about some of the kind of the key elements to effective coaching and effective coaching conversations, but things get in the way, right? So we've got a few here that we want to just kind of talk through. The first one is that over, over focus on pipeline reviews, right? Because we talked about balancing those different types of coaching conversations. So a barrier then would be you're not doing enough of the skills coaching and you're really focusing on pipeline review and calling it coaching. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think then as you move into kind of fear of conflict and, and look, nobody likes conflict. There's, um, I don't think anybody wakes up in the morning and, and looks to uh, have difficulty or, or conflict in their life. And I think often what happens is because of this aversion to conflict, sometimes it 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 
it, it creates an environment where obviously maybe we're not being as honest as we need to be. And with that candor, it's okay. And, you know, as I consult with people all the time, it is okay if you're having a conversation and you're uncomfortable about that conversation to acknowledge that. For example, if I was talking to Michelle and I had to talk with her about something that made me feel uneasy or made me feel a little um, uh, anxious, it's completely okay for me to say to Michelle as my direct report, Michelle, hey, listen, we have to have a conversation today. And, and to be honest with you, this is a hard conversation for me to have. And, and I'm not thrilled and I don't like to have to have it. But nonetheless, it's a conversation that we need to have. That's a more disarming approach than to completely ignore the fact that there is some aversion to conflict. The probability will start to diminish that you're going to be successful. The conversation becomes very introspective and becomes more about us. So if there's conflict, address it. But first address the conflict within yourself and verbalize it. Um, as long as you're on the side of the truth, you're never going to be wrong. And if you're feeling anxious or not sure, simply talk about it. People can appreciate that and they can understand it. Yeah, that's that's so um, that's so true. And I think to your point, your seller, your direct report is going to appreciate yeah. that that kind of vulnerability, yes. for lack of a better word. Um, you know, I think some of this comes from many managers being promoted into their roles from right? <laughs> from being a seller, right? And so their peers, their former peers. Um, and so I think that makes it uncomfortable. Obviously, some individuals are wired more to fear conflict. Right. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You, you know, there's the old the old adage, you know, practice makes perfect. Well, as we all know, that's not really true. Practice makes permanent. And often, as we're going to move into in a second about lacking skills, you know, regardless if you're trying to be a plumber or a personal, whatever it's trying to be, keep in mind, often we learn from coaches or leaders that we've had in the past that doesn't necessarily make it good or correct or right. Again, the importance of a skilled professional that has that mastered that craft. But again, you can kind of see how these things kind of can, can compile and kind of become a kerfuffle of a, just a, a huge issue that can create the probability that we're not going to be as successful as we'd like to be. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So lacking skills, that's another uh, management barrier, right? So managers, again, those managers that are promoted in from, from a sales role, uh, that's a completely different skill set from, you know, from selling. Um, so they may know how to close deals, but they don't know how to coach. That's right. And, you know, unfortunately, there's not, well, maybe there is a YouTube video on how to coach. Uh, there, there clearly is one on how to change a <laughs> sink, obviously, so it didn't help me too much. But I, again, I think it's important to recognize, as I said earlier, it's a perishable skill. Because we move into or we've been in management or leadership for some time, if it's been 30 years or if it's been three days, the best leaders recognize the transparency of what sometimes we're good at, and maybe sometimes what we need help with. And sometimes if you talk about blind spots, we don't know. Right. We don't know if we're coaching well or if, or if we're not. And what we do is we then go to the lagging indicators. And while that may be one measurement of our ability to coach, it's not the be all. And so, again, I think it's important to open ourselves up. Um, there is no, uh, there's, the, what is the old adage? Uh, sunlight is the best disinfectant there is. Well, in, in leadership and in coaching, candor. And that's, you know, intrinsic candor as well as uh, candor that we provide other people around us is, the, is yeah. the best. Factor. Yeah. And you mentioned kind of at the beginning of our conversation um, about sometimes we feel like as leaders, as managers, it's faster, it's easier to do it myself, um, which can also kind of feed into that blind spot. We don't see how our own habits are getting in the way. Absolutely. A absolutely. We, Again, it goes kind of back to the conversation we were having a few minutes ago in the sense that, you know, we think there's a right way to do things. And so it may be the right way. It may not be. The interesting thing about human beings is that we will do something and this is a form of, of conditioned response, we will do something the way that we have learned um, until somebody else comes along and shows us necessarily a better, faster, more efficient way. It doesn't mean the way that you're doing it doesn't get the job done, but there may be a better, faster, more effective way to do this. And in this case, hence coaching. Yeah, yeah. So how do we kind of address some of these barriers? 
Is that for me, Michelle? Are you asking? Yeah. Uh, you well, asking I mean, no, maybe, I mean yeah. you, but maybe even even you know the crowd. Yeah, I, mean, I think. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Eric, right. coaches training. need just as much training as, as, as anyone. Um, you know, I, I I read an article several years ago that um, Tom Brady uh, changed his personal trainer every 90 days. And he said he did that not because he wasn't happy with what he was um, receiving, but he wanted new perspective. He wanted to make sure he was getting the best. He wanted new ideas. And so I think it's important that we do those things. And I think that it's important that we create environments with uh, the people that we support. And when I say support, that work for us, that we open up the uh, channels of communication and we ask for feedback and not shy away from it. Because just because we don't ask for it doesn't mean that it's not there. Just because we don't ask for it doesn't mean people aren't thinking it and feeling it. Well, I'd rather know what someone's thinking and what they're feeling so I can deal with it. It doesn't just mean I agree with it. And maybe I'll tell them that I simply don't agree with it. But again, so much of this is about the art of communication and breaking down those silo, silos around these four pillars that you see kind of on the on the screen. And in every situation, we have the opportunity as all of these things here are perishable. So it's not like we're saddled or stuck with any one of them. We can affect them. And it's important that we that we do that. Yeah. It sounds like kind of a combination then of developing skills and then developing your own self-awareness in terms of how you approach a coaching conversation. Yeah, you know, it's a great point. You know, when you think about folks that, uh, you know, embrace kind of the pillars of emotional intelligence and this idea of empathy and this idea that, you know, we really want to understand where another person is, um, it, it's extremely, as we've learned through Goldman and others, it's an extremely important and perishable skill to be emotionally intelligent. However, sometimes I have seen in situations, even the more emotionally intelligent folks have a harder time with some of these things, not because you can be over empathetic, but you can think about, man, th this isn't, again, going to feel right. And we fear that conflict, or maybe it's not conflict that we fear. We fear possibly telling someone something that might disrupt their feelings or make them feel a certain way about themselves. And because we can empathize. So the self-awareness part is um, is really important. But again, the antidote for that, as I said earlier, is just to be honest about what you have to talk about. And if it's not easy for you and you, you think that it might not land the, the best with someone, acknowledge it, be authentic and be genuine. Yeah. So before we move on, we uh, a question came in that I feel like is maybe a combination of barriers to coaching and effective coaching conversations. So Brent is asking about tips for balancing coaching with a remote team and conversations like, for instance, what kinds of conversations should you have um, on the phone or Zoom versus waiting to have them in person? So what are your thoughts on those? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I, I think that what I would offer is that you, you kind of have two different uh, motions going on. I think that there should be some routine cadence. And, and for, again, as Michelle talked about process, routine cadence for coaching interactions. Um, keep in mind, coaching is not always about correction or telling someone that they need to change. Correction is also, or I'm sorry, coaching is all about making deposits as well. It's okay to have a half hour coaching call scheduled and not need the whole half hour. It's okay to talk about other things in that person's development. So um, as you, you've seen from um, you know some of the research Michelle has done previously, her and her team, that even the top performers want to be coached. It's incumbent upon us to, to do that. So the first thing I would offer you in terms of phone versus Zoom versus in person is that you, you establish that routine cadence and that cadence is part of the process. And so again, you, you follow that process. Now there's gonna be certain things that will require uh, some degree of urgency. Um, you know, you, you may want to, you know, a certain deal. We talked earlier about kind of deal dynamics and when a deal is kind of in play, we're getting down to the two yard line. We may need to go back and forth. Um, you know, and I think what I would offer you in terms of in-person versus, um, you know, uh, the phone, this is a personal opinion in that, you know, we all experienced the pandemic and there was thoughts out there that, you know, this was going to change the landscape of the way that we do business moving forward. And while I think it, it's definitely uh, added a new dimension to the way that we do business, I don't think it's wholesale changed it. And I say that as um, if you think back to when we were in the midst of the pandemic, 
everybody wanted to open back up. We wanted to get back out there. As human beings, sociologically speaking, we are social creatures. And so what I would offer you, though, it is important to spend time in person with your sellers. And that doesn't always necessarily have to be to deliver, you know, just corrective or or or, or difficult coaching. It can be holistically part of that, but to get to know them, to spend time with them, to understand and connect with them, I think is is important. And sometimes, honestly, that's more of an art than a science. And so I think, again, just kind of recap, I kind of, you know, uh, told you kind of, you know, um, so cadence, make sure you're having frequent conversations and then filter in or kind of um, season in those in-person meetings. But again, I would, I would establish those ahead of time, unless there may be a, 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 an immediate need. Thank you, Dan. I know I went on a little bit there. Sorry. <laughs> sorry about I told that. everyone sorry it was going to be Jared. a lively conversation. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> no apologies needed. All right. Let's now talk about seller barriers to coaching. So we have a couple here, excuses and blind spots. Um, so excuses being, well, you know, Dan, like I don't have enough leads, right? If we're talking about performance kinds of things, our product is overpriced. Our product is defective. Um, you know, so they're making excuses for their performance rather than taking ownership. Yeah. You know, it's funny. You talked about Bill Brooks being a football coach. You know, when you're playing a more difficult team, you can't walk out there and say, well, this, this person is too big. I can't block them. You got to figure out a way to get around it. Maybe those things are true. Maybe we're not getting as many leads as we'd like to, or maybe we are priced a little bit differently. Okay. What are we going to, the, the question becomes is don't allow yourself as a manager to get mired in that. Even if you know that to be true, again, honesty and transparency. Look, I understand that leads are a little slow right now. I understand that maybe from a price point, we, we, we aren't as competitive as we'd like to be. What are we going to do about it? What, what, what do we do? How are we going to block this person? So again, I think it's, I think it's important to think about what is it we're going to do? Again, the leading indicators, not the fact that we're overpriced or leads aren't coming in. Okay, we acknowledge that, sure. But we can't just go out there and say we're not going to win because of these things. And so you remove these excuses. And as you can kind of see some of the methodology that Michelle is imploring is that these things have a thread that run through them. So you talk about kind of as we talked about earlier in terms of creating kind of um co-creating the solution. So, okay, look, we have these issues. What are we going to do about it? And so I think it's really important, again, open doors, remove obstacles, and think about how we're going to get past these um, these um, these excuses. Yeah. And then blind spots, um, to me, that's really more that, is it a, a skill issue or is it a, a will or a capability um, or a willingness to perform? You know, is it an attitude or a poor fit? Um, or a disengagement type issue versus truly just lacking the skills or, um, you know, an area that where they're willing to be coached, they're willing and they want to, to improve yeah. and they just need, you know, they just need the, the effort put towards it. Right. And, and I think, you know, as human beings, sometimes what we do is we put our blinders on and, and we, we don't want to see things that might be uneasy for us to see or, uh, shake hands with uh, our reality sometimes in terms of, of what things are. And those creates those blind spots where that, those abilities, blind spots, um, while the, the vernacular of blind spots seems to believe that something we don't see, sometimes they're self-created because we create the blind spot because we don't want to address the problem or we don't want to deal with what may be perceived as an inadequacy or, or something that we don't do very well. So Again, I think some of the tactics that we're talking about help break those things down. And again, as I said a few minutes ago, people have an intrinsic need and desire to feel valued. And if they know that, listen, we we take you all blind spots and all, let's talk about how we're going to get around these things. People will walk through those doors that you're opening up for. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. Now we're going to talk about behavior versus results. So this quadrant, and we all know Dan loves a good quadrant, I love a good um, summarizes kind of some typical kind of performance scenarios that managers face. Um, and I think this kind of informs the direction of your coaching and the types of conversations. So Dan, I'm going to turn this over to you yeah. Yeah, and this let is, you kind of talk us through. Yeah, this is, this. thanks, Joe. This is kind of uh, 
my child, so to speak, one of the first things that uh, myself or anyone on my team do when we go out and consult with a client is we introduce this model. And so I want to share it with you. Um, as you've seen, we've talked about the importance of leading indicators versus lagging indicators. On the top part of that quadrant, you're going to see the leading indicators. So if you kind of walk this chart or this quadrant with me, um, if you have, I'm sorry, on the, um, if you have good behaviors and good results, okay, then obviously what you want to do is give that person more, promote them, do whatever you need to do. They're, they're doing well. Um, if you have someone that has good behavior and bad results, well, maybe they're new. Maybe they're, they're new in their position. Maybe they're um, still trying to figure out how to do an expense report. But you know what? They're showing up every day. They're bright-eyed. They're fresh-faced. They're working hard. So we want to invest in them. Because if you believe that the leading indicator to results is behavior, those are good things. And I said uh, north part of the chart. I meant right versus left. And if you move kind of um, a, kind of across the chart, you think about someone that's got there in the lower left, bad behavior and bad results, um, you know, we'd like to free up their future for them to do something else, maybe with a competitor. Uh, that becomes a pretty easy fix. But where we have the most challenges is in leadership is that person that has bad behavior but good results. Does anybody have the seller or person that they are they turn in rock star numbers? They're great with clients, they have great relationships, but you know what? Can't get them on a conference call, you can't find them. In the middle of the day, you um, they 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 want to take issue with everything that you say. There's no easy acceptance of of the ideas and things that we'd like to implore. So, what's important to understand is if you were to look at this and you know um, you know scribble this down or whatever you have on a piece of paper, the first thing I would do is I would I would put dots around where I would categorize my sales team. The more dots you have on the right side of that chart, the more poised you are for growth. The more dots you have on the left, the more difficult time you're going to have with growth. The question that I get and my team gets probably more than any other question is that person with bad behavior and good results, what do you do with them? And here's what I would offer you. While there is no optimal solution sometimes, I think that from a psychological perspective, if we believe that good behaviors will drive good results, it's probably not a huge leap to think that that individual who has bad behavior at this point in time, at some point probably had good behavior because they learned to get the results. And so what I find happens is often something has occurred or happened to this individual, maybe had nothing to do, often had nothing to do with you uh, or the present situation that has affected their perception. And I talked about those blinders with blind spots. And so what happens is they settle in. We've heard people say things like this in business and in life. Well, listen, I'm just going to do my job, keep my head down and do the things I need to do. Well, that obviously is to some degree, not necessarily a bad behavior, but it's not moving through the, the behavior pattern that we'd like to see. So here's what I would offer you. Um, those people that have bad behaviors, I think that if you think about kind of the, the concepts that we've talked about, You've got to go to that person. You've got to dig out what's driving that bad behavior. And often you'll find that it's something in the past or something that's happened to them that's causing them to drive that behavior. And the reason that it's continuing is because no one's addressed it. No one's went and talked to them about it. No one said, hey, you're very valued here, but th these two things are not in concert. They're not uh, congruent, your behaviors and your results. Let's talk about this a little bit. And try to kind of, uh, surgically, to the extent that you can, pull out some of those uh, barriers, open doors, remove obstacles that are causing those behavioral deficiencies. Again, at the end of the day, uh, in life, we get what we settle for. So if we're not happy with what we have, we settle for it. We have someone that we're chasing around because we need expense reports or we can't find them or they won't get on a conference call or they're making our life difficult. Well, we have to be clear eyed and ask ourselves, we're settling for that. And so um, people have an obligation to again, move past that, or at least to that 50% threshold. And so I, again, I would encourage you to have those conversations, talk about some of the things that are difficult sometimes, understand why the behavioral pattern is what it is, and um, work to kind of, again, do the things we need to do to try to hopefully get them to the right side of that chart. So what I'm 
kind of hearing you say on that is just because somebody has bad behavior and good results, it's not an automatic get rid of them. It's more of a really dig down. That's where you need to use your coaching skills to right. understand kind of what's driving that bad behavior. And is it a situation where they're coachable or not? Exactly. Listen, great leaders are able to go into that quadrant where someone has bad behaviors and good results and move them to the right side of that chart. Um, that is a much more cost effective from kind of a human capital perspective. Um, but what's also important as you look at this quadrant and kind of charting your team is that birds of a feather flock together often, as we've heard. And so if you are tolerating bad behaviors in certain scenarios, it's not so it, what starts to happen in organizational dynamics is that the rest of the team starts to see those behaviors being tolerated. Then then, then the idea of well, why should I do this? Well, well, if I don't have, if she or he doesn't have to do this, and we've probably all been there in those situations. Great players, great sellers want to be part of great teams. Your foremost obligation through coaching as a leader is to ensure that you've created the environment for a great team. Great co coaches have great teams. And so that is comprised of standards and a vision of what the expectation is going to be. And if people don't necessarily desire that expectation, or maybe it's not the right fit for them, there, there's someplace else probably that's better off for them. Yeah, yeah. We've gotten a lot of comments. Um, Quadrants always do, Michelle. Yes, you're right. You're right. You're right. Yes. Um, but, it, you know, a lot of comments around this kind of idea of bad behavior and um, good results uh, and and how you, you deal with that. And I do agree there's some comments in here that there's kind of an organizational dynamic to it as well. And I think you kind of alluded to that um, in terms of, you know, what is it that leadership in general will allow and settle for? Right. And what messages are they sending down to the sales team that perhaps is influencing or encouraging certain types of, of behavior? You know, it's human beings. <laughs> Often we'd like to think that we are always going to perform to our, our highest multiple. But what and Michelle would know this far better than I would as, as the research guru, guru. Research shows that that's not always true in that sometimes we tend to. Uh, gravitate towards the lowest multiple or the easiest thing, the, the, the path of least resistance, mm -hmm. if you will. And so, again, I think it, it, it's it's imperative. And I know I, I talk a lot about uh, sports. I'm a big sports fan. But you think about uh, great, uh, great teams. Great teams have great coaches. And great players want to go play for great coaches, not because it's easy, but because they want to win. And they want to be yeah. part of that, that culture. And we as leaders have the opportunity to create the culture that we would like to create. And that is the first step in gaining dominance over your competition. Yeah, yeah, good point. Okay, question on the um, on the quadrant before we move ahead. This is on the good, good quadrant, yeah. right? The good behavior, good results. So what happens if, a, um, if you have a seller or an individual who doesn't want to be promoted and they stay in that position? On yeah. the good, good side. Yeah. So I think, and I know Michelle, in a couple of minutes, we're going to talk about peer coaching, but I think that's a great opportunity for someone that is good to good. Um, what's important to recognize is that the develop the development sequence never stops, or that we as leaders never stop providing that development sequence. Again, it's it, I hearken back to some of the conversation we had earlier about Let's have a collective conversation. Hey, listen, I, I totally get that you don't want to do more, that you're happy where you are, but you're a huge resource here, acknowledging obviously what they're good at, expressing their value, and then helping them understand kind of what is it you'd like to do? Because I think you have a lot of uh, runway and, and bring them into other things. Uh, use them for peer coaching, as we'll talk about here in just a few minutes. Um, but again, we don't have to have all of the solutions. It's important that we work in partnership with them to create solutions uh, around common ground. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think that's an opportunity too to have that conversation around what does the future look like? What do you, where, What is it that you want to do? It's not necessarily a bad thing if somebody doesn't want to be promoted if they're a good performer or a top performer in that role and they're happy yeah. doing that. But it's also, I, I, would, I would encourage you to find out why it is that they don't want to move forward. 
Um, typically, when people don't want to move forward, there is a uh, fear-based perspective, and fear, as we all know, is the unknown. There is something that is holding them back, and as leaders, uh, again, in terms of removing obstacles and open doors, what we need to do for our folks is make the unknowns known. And sometimes that's in a difficult conversation, but often it's it's in a conversation where we have someone that is a, a good performer that may be kind of um, second-guessing their abilities or their attributes. And so it's important for us to kind of shepherd them through those conversations. And candidly, not because it's good for the organization, but because it's good for them. And leaders that understand that put their, their individuals wants and needs ahead of their own and the organizations will always be more successful than those that don't. Yeah. And I'm going to put one more kind of um, plug in for the use of, you know, personal assessments, behavioral assessments as, um, you know, as a tool for any really one of these quadrants uh, in terms of, of informing those conversations. I know I talk about them a lot, but if you want to understand maybe what's driving that bad behavior, if you want to understand what really is motivating that person with good behavior and good results, and you want to find a way to reward and kind of stimulate that behavior, um, these are great tools for doing that. It could really help uncover mindset issues, that, that willingness to perform versus the capability to perform, help you understand where the skill gaps might be. So something definitely to consider if it's not in your arsenal, um, you know, in your toolbox to think about that as just another great coaching tool to inform these types of conversations. Yeah. And Michelle, you know, to take it even a step further, I would, I would go further than to say that they're a powerful tool. I would tell you as a sales leader myself, they are an essential tool. If you want to increase the probability of doing the things that we're talking about. Um, look, I mean, it, it's important to be able to see kind of underneath the hood of a car before you buy it. It's equally as important to be able to kind of see underneath the hood of another individual before you hire them while you're managing them while you're trying to develop them onto other things. Um, and without the assessment, really all that it is, is a guess. And science doesn't lie. And the science gives us more than anything, which is the most important thing in all business and personal interactions, it gives us confidence. Not because we think it, but because the science tells us. When you go to the doctor and you walk in and you say, hey doc, listen, I don't feel very good. I've been kind of lightheaded and my heart's kind of racing. Doctor says, okay, well, here, let me go ahead and prescribe you some blood pressure medication. Doctor's not going to do that. Doctor's going to say, let's take your blood pressure. Let's do some lab work. That's what the assessments do. It's that blood pressure. It's that lab work. So you can see exactly what's going on and then diagnose and uh, coach uh, appropriately. Yeah, great, great points. All right, so we've talked about, you know, how, different types of kind of performers and performer performance issues. We talked about what a good coaching conversation looks like. Now there's the follow-up. So, you know, just some key points here in terms of how do you follow up after coaching? And I think this is, an, again, another one of those issues that I hear from clients about really the accountability, right? Does the, are you, if you're investing time in coaching um, your sellers, you need to follow up and hold them accountable. Absolutely. Again, I'll say it again, we get in life what we settle for. And again, this ties into Michelle's point around a lot of the dialogue that we've had. Sometimes we're not as good about holding people uh, as accountable as we should. Maybe it's because we have an extreme amount of emotional intelligence. Maybe it's because we don't want to deal with the conflict. Maybe it's, it's for a myriad of reasons. But, um, you know, people... I don't, I don't say that people need to be accountable. People want to be accountable. And if you've created the right environment, the right cadence, the right process, and kind of, again, for the fifth time, open those doors, remove those obstacles, people want to be accountable. Because when you're accountable, you win. And people want to win. And I can almost tell you, while as sellers, we all like the money, but I can almost bet that your best sellers, and maybe many of you, it's not about the money. It's about the win that gets us excited. And you can't win unless you take accountability. Great sellers want the ball when the game's on the line with two seconds left. And so we have to create that framework for them to be accountable. Yep. So there was a comment in the chat uh, a few minutes ago about peer coaching, and it's like they could read our minds because, <laughs> um, <laughs> excuse me, 
we want to talk a little bit about incorporating peer coaching. It is a way to really scale your efforts. Coaching does not always have to be on the manager. Sure. And in, in our research, we found that those successful teams, again, those that um, hit their revenue goals in the previous year, are more likely to leverage peer coaching as a development tool for their teams compared to those underperforming teams. And you know, Dan, I know you've done quite a bit of group coaching and seen peer coaching and, and worked yeah. with groups in that way. So tell us some of your thoughts and best practices. Yeah, so I, I couldn't agree more with this. In the military, we call this force multiplying our re re resources, where we take our resources and we expand upon them. That's really the essence of peer coaching. And I call it kind of in, in, um, in, in easier terms, putting your aces in their places. So you wanna take your very best players, you want to give them more opportunities to kind of force multiply you the resources that you have. And so it does a lot of different things. Is I talked earlier about recognizing value in the things that people do. So often you'll find that, oh, Sally or Bob does this really, really well, or Jane or Jack does this really, really well. Well, what I would do is bring those individuals into environments, either kind of in one-off situations or in group team meeting situations where they get to demonstrate the skill set that they have, not only because it shows that you recognize the value that you're bringing, it provides a resource to other team members, creates dialogue, opens up channels of communication. The people that are out there carrying the bags will always, right, wrong, or indifferent, garner more respect than we do kind of sometimes from verbally sitting behind the desk. And so, to the extent that you can draw that out in peer environments, gives you time, not to say that it's self-serving, but it gives you more time in your day and I to do other things when you can send maybe some stronger performers in certain areas to work with maybe some folks that have those opportunities. The key in peer coaching is recognizing that everyone has a strength and bringing all those strengths to the table, creates you know, cohesion in the team. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, just kind of thinking back to the conversation we were having around the quadrants, it's a great opportunity for someone that is that good performer, um, good results. That's of. right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, question on the coaching follow-up. Um, what have we found? What are your thoughts on a template for capturing coaching sessions to ensure the, um, the process and stay on top of coaching progress, you know, once you have that initial conversation and you have a plan for moving forward? Yeah, I think, I think it's important. But um, again, a lot of this is going to be stylistically driven. Michelle talks about the importance of different styles. Um, as someone that, that is kind of more of the D&I variant, I'm going to write bullet points and I'm going to send an email after a conversation and say, hey, Michelle, great talking to you today. We agreed that you're going to do X, Y, and Z, A, B, and C, one, two, and three by these dates. Please let me know if you see things any different. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the right way to do it. Someone that might be more of the CRS variant may want a more detailed, more um, thorough plan. But here's the key. It's important, as Michelle talked about earlier, it's important that we are responding and adapting to what the seller needs. So if I am managing someone that is a different variant or different dimension than I am, I wanna make sure that I'm giving that information to them in a way that is, um, uh, conducive to them being successful, not the way necessarily that I want it. So I think it's really about uh, what's going to make sense. And the way you find that out is you, you ask your team members, again, that transparency, that open dialogue, hey, how would you like to capture this conversation so we can make sure we stay on track moving forward? Yeah. Simple as that. Yep. Great point. I do think documentation is important. And so to your point, you know, it could be a form or a tool we have yep. one. It can be an email with bullet points as long yep. as it's clear and, and well laid out. So it's what works best um, in your situation, given your styles. And I would also say, when I say document, document early and often. And I don't mean, necessarily mean document just the negative interactions. Again, uh, we want to make deposits in our people. So when people are doing things well, it's just as important that we recognize them for that. Um, as we do sometimes and we have to inevitably kind of work on some of the things that, that might be uh, a little bit lacking in some folks. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that because I do think there can be that mindset of coaching being yeah. punitive versus That's developmental. Right. Yeah, right. yeah. 
<clears throat> so a few key takeaways here. I also want to encourage folks, if you have additional questions, put them in chat or Q&A. Um, but just kind of the highlights of our conversation today about balancing those pipeline reviews, deal coaching and performance coaching, identifying and addressing barriers to coaching, tailoring the, your coaching based on seller behavior and results. I mean, we've talked about that all the way through. Establishing accountability through follow-up and leveraging peer coaching for seller development. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we have a few um, resources for you. Um, feel free to scan the QR code if you're interested in any of these. Our coaching services, um, Coaching to Impact, which is a um, a coaching program that we offer, the assessments. We have a white paper on the ultimate guide to sales coaching. We'll also give you some great tips. And Dan, I do have a question for you that came in on chat. Okay. And that is, um, how do managers balance the need to inspect or touch like every deal um, with the limited time that they have in a one to one? in a one-on-one. -on -one. So the, this need potentially to know about everything versus, you know, how do they scale their time better? Yeah, great, great question. I think the first thing to think about is we have to meet different sellers at different points. A seasoned, uh, good behaviors, good results seller, we probably don't need uh, that level of detail within um, everything that they have going on. Someone that may be newer, maybe good result, maybe good behaviors, bad results, they're getting, they're learning, they need more coaching. And so the reason I, I say that is because uh, for lack of a better term, you can kind of rob Peter to pay Paul with time. If you need more time with a more or less seasoned seller, you can get that by way of not needing it and empowering people. Um, the other thing that, that, that I think is important is that uh, one of the things that I used to do is around crunch time, typically if it was the last few weeks of the quarter, it was, you know, the, the, the last few weeks of the year, I would do what I call a hot list. And I would ask my team, I would say, send me your top three accounts that you think, uh, you know, you need the most assistance on or the highest uh, revenue yield, whatever, whatever kind of metrics that you want. So you can be kind of surgically focused in terms of what is going to move the needle. Um and again, a lot of that is going to be style. Some of us, again, different personality type, types are going to want to get more into every deal and understand them. Some of us that are not are going to want to be kind of maybe more 60,000 feet. So again, it's that confluence of art and science, but there's a couple of things that I would offer you that might be able to help you kind of uh, shore some of that stuff up. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so a comment, not so much a, a question, um, and that was on, um, you, you talked about recognizing um, top performers or recognizing the successes. Mm -hmm. And so one of the comments that came in, some suggestions, things like um, having a happy hour that highlights wins and mm. successes, um, you know, kind of highlighting and celebrating those together yes. as a team, even as opposed to just even one-on-one. -on -one. Absolutely. Yep. All right. Well, we are at the top of the hour. I want to thank you, Dan, for joining me. Thank you, Michelle. And Thanks for having yes. me. It's always, As a always, always a lively conversation. Yes. Always fun. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Just thank as you. a reminder to everyone here, um, the mm -hmm. webinar will be recorded. And so um, you will you can look for that recording to come to come out um, in the next few days. And thank you again. And we look forward to having you join us on our next webinar.